But first of all, let me add my welcome to the ones that you've already heard. Um, particular welcome to the fathers, the dads. It is Father's Day. Um, as Paul said, I know it can be a day of mixed emotions for many, but it's right to honour fathers um, who are serious about that task and also the spiritual fathers who I know many of us have benefited from in the church. I won't name them because it will probably make them feel old that someone of my age is designating them as a, a father figure to me. And also a welcome to you if you are a visitor. Please join us after the service for lunch. And these lunches are so important in our corporate community here because an opportunity for us to spend time with one another, connect and live out something of what it means to be a fellowship and some of the things I'm talking about today. And it's particularly important because we live in a society that really values, idolizes individualism. Self-expression, that the road to joy is about discovering who you are and achieving your goals and that individual fulfillment matters above anything else. And you see that in the workplace and the focus on kind of career progression you see it even, I've got a two-year-old and a six-year-old. I've watched a lot of Disney films and it struck me recently how many of the Disney princesses have to disobey their parents at some point in order to discover who they are and uh, come into their destiny. And of course, sometimes that makes sense. You know, I'm not approving of the arranged marriages suggested in Aladdin and Brave, but it, it's indicative of a, a general trend in our society that the individual uh, is paramount and the key to fulfillment is in living out your best life as an individual. And individualism is on display in the church as well. Uh, whether it's an unwillingness to commit until we find a church that ticks all our boxes, so we move beyond discernment into consumerism. Whether it's that we only come to church with a posture to receive and not to serve or worship or give. Whether it's an increasing tendency in sort of certain songs where the emphasis is all about me receiving an experience rather than honouring the holy God who gave his one and only son so that we can be accepted in his sight. The church is affected by individualitis, if you want to call it that, just as much as the world. And that's not a new problem. It first appeared in the early chapters of the Bible where Adam and Eve chose to put themselves first and before what God had told them. And everything that we've done since then is a, a copy of that, as we've been putting ourselves before God. But as we see in the early chapters of Genesis, the outcome of putting ourselves before God and our own fulfillment above worshipping Him is one of judgment, where we find ourselves separated from God, human relationships fractured, uh, and certainly not what they are, are meant to be uh, in God's best for us. And as we'll sort of talk later, one of the reasons why Jesus came was to undo that so that we can have full relationship with God again, with the judgment removed and close relationship with one another. But it's also important to note that the solution to individualism isn't just community. There have been plenty of communities or ideologies or political movement that have gathered a following, sometimes a huge following, but they've had just as destructive results in their own way. And remember the God who said in Genesis 2, it's not good for man to be alone. It's also the one who in Genesis 11 said it's not good for people to come together if it's not around me and it's to make a name for themselves and that's why God created all the different nations and languages because it wasn't good for men and women to all come together when he isn't at the center of that community. So community and individualism of themselves have a lot of problems and the solution I'm going to put to you today is Christian fellowship and we're going to look at what it is, why it matters and what it means practically for those of us who are committed to the church in Westminster, or if you're a visitor, some things that hopefully you can take away to your respective churches as the Lord may lead. As Paul says, we're in week three of our series, Church, a Window into a Better World. And as we're looking at these final verses of Acts chapter two, you'll remember for the bulk of that chapter, Peter has preached a sermon as the Holy Spirit has fallen on the disciples and then as they respond to his message that Peter says, you guys killed Jesus, he died for your sin, but he rose again because he's conquered death. And through repentance and faith in him, you can conquer death in him and be given a new resurrection life. And as Peter's kind of reached the end of his sermon, the first verse of the reading shows that 3000 people were added to the number that day. And in these next verses, we see the move from personal decision 
to corporate devotion. And the topic we're looking at today is fellowship. So first of all then, what is fellowship? Well, depending on your background, it's a word with different connotations. For some of you, a fellowship meeting conjures up dreary images. Uh, when I was a child, the church that my parents and my grandmother went to had a weekly fellowship meeting, which was typically you'd go to, it was a group of older ladies, they'd go to one of the houses, they'd have tea and Madeira cake, um, and they'd uh, homemade Madeira cake, don't scoff. Um, they certainly did actually. Um, and they played the piano and sung hymns, and look, I don't want to belittle that, but as a young boy and a teenager, didn't hold that much appeal to me. But on the other hand, some of us think that, well, fellowship is just a Christian byword for a social. In the same way, if you're putting on a party and you want it to sound refined, you call it a soiree. You know, fellowship's just a bit of jargon. Well, both of those characterizations don't fairly reflect what is meant by that uh, in the Bible. And the word translated fellowship here is the Greek word ko koinonia, and it's used in many parts of the Bible to describe different things. It's to describe sharing with someone in something, participating in something, contributing to something, being connected to something bigger than yourself. Elsewhere in the New Testament, it's used to describe a business partnership. And the thing with a partnership is the partners come together, the business makes profit, they all take home the cash. If it goes under, then you know, creditors might come after their houses and their cars. You know, you're joined together, you share in the highs and the lows. And the picture on the slide behind me of those two twins, these were Chang and Eng Bunker. They were from Thailand in their era in the 1800s, it was called Siam. And they were conjoined twins. They were twins who, when they were sort of separating in the womb, they didn't fully separate. And for the rest of their lives, they were joined together at the side and they kind of shared a common liver. And they lived full lives. They had 21 children between them. They had a lot of money. And, uh, and I know that raises all sorts of questions, but I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm not going there, and uh, yeah. Um, and that's where we get the phrase Siamese twins, because that was their, their show name as they went around all the fairs and showed themselves off. Well, in ancient writings, kind of contemporary with these biblical writings, they used this word fellowship, this koinonia, to describe the connection of conjoined twins where you are inseparable. And the way fellowship is used in the Bible is used in two senses, two special connections that a believer has. The first is a special connection that a believer has to God. I mentioned at the start, we come under God's judgment through our sin, but as a result of Jesus' saving death and resurrection, anyone who turns from their sin and puts their faith in Jesus is forgiven of their sin. His righteousness is imputed to them. They're brought into relationship with God, adopted as his children. But more than that, we are spiritually joined to God. It doesn't mean we are God but we have a special connection with God. And one sign of this is what Peter says in Acts 2.38, that all who believe will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Father or the Son. He is holy. He can't just dwell anywhere. But it's as a result of this spiritual connection we have that he now lives in all believers. And as he comes in Acts, he fulfills the words of Jesus in John 14, that you will know I, Jesus, am in my Father. You are in me. I am in you. And Paul said something similar in 1 Corinthians 6, that anybody joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, that we are connected to Jesus. And if you're a Christian, you are connected. I want you to have that in mind. It isn't just being a Christian about being delivered from the punishment of your sin. It isn't even just about being forgiven and adopted. It's about being given a spiritual connection to God. And it's a, an encouraging thing because when Jesus died, Romans 5 says, we died with him. When he rose again, spiritually we rose with him and physically we will rise again when he returns. And it's why in Ephesians 2, Paul talks about um, how he is seated in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. Because in a spiritual sense, he is so closely connected that where Jesus goes, we go as well. And that goes the other way where we go, Jesus is with us. And it's why when um, Jesus confronted Saul on the road to Damascus and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul had never met Jesus, but Saul was persecuting Christians. And it's kind of like a mafia connection. You hit someone in the family, then everyone's affected right up to the dawn. And that's who Jesus is. Where he goes, we go. 
And another way this fellowship's described in Ephesians 5 is of a mystical union, that the closest resemblance in humankind is the, the union between a husband and a wife because we are so closely and intimately connected. And in the words of my all-time favorite hymn, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? We have an interest in Jesus' blood because we are united with him. We have koinonia, fellowship, connection with God. We also have fellowship with one another, and that's the primary way this word is used. It's certainly the way it's used in verse 42. And you cannot underestimate the importance the early church had to the Spirit of God being received by believers. In Acts 10, the Spirit falls on Gentiles after Peter's preaching, and when he's questioned on that on a couple of occasions, you know, why are you doing this with the Gentiles? He says, God is with these people because he sent his Spirit to them. And if God validates them as being part of our community, I'm going to validate them as well. In other words, if someone has fellowship with God, we're going to have fellowship with them as well. We're going to be connected to them. Because you know, the church isn't so much a fan club where we follow Jesus. It's a body where we are connected to him. And through that connection, we are connected with one another. And it's an interesting thought that we could only be connected to God because of Jesus. And we can only be connected to one another without the damaging effects of sin because of Jesus as well. And Ephesians 2 kind of Paul talks about that as he brings the Gentiles and the Jews together through his death. And that means our hopes, our dreams, our destinies and our eternal futures are bound up together because we are all bound up with Jesus. And we need to remember that church. We don't come to this church or any other church because we have friends who are like ourselves with common interests, similar demographic. We're here for him. And because of what he has done, he has brought us together and grafted us into one. In other parts of the Bible, Paul uses the metaphor of a body to describe this connection, where Jesus is the head, and every Christian is an indispensable part of that body that the body needs to function. And if part of that body suffers, it's like losing your finger. The body is incomplete. It can't function as it's supposed to do so. It says that when one member suffers, the whole body suffers, and when one member rejoices, all rejoice. And that's true in the kind of global sense of the church, but it's particularly acute and felt in a local church like Westminster Chapel. That's a sign of our fellowship. And you know, I can't not comment on some of the scandals we've heard in recent years on sort of TV and pastors falling down. And you know, often so much of that is that a man or a woman or a Christian leader has a powerful vision of what true unity and fellowship looks like. And they set powerful goals as what they want it to be. And it's kind of a utopian reality. And at its best, the church can be like that. But the church is a connection between real people. And it is messy. It isn't always beautiful. And arguably, it's just an extension of individualism when you do that, because it's one person's vision that he's calling other people to. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was an underground pastor in 1930s Germany, who was uh, eventually arrested by the Nazis and martyred. There's a statue of him above the door alongside Martin Luther King and other modern martyrs at Westminster Abbey. Um, he wrote a book called Life Together about what Christian community looks like. And, you know, it's quite prophetic in a lot of ways because he would have to spend much of his following years living underground in hiding as Hitler rose to power and it wasn't safe to be a Christian who condemned the work of the Nazis. And he spoke about leaders who set forth visions. Um, he said, God hates visionary dreaming. It makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. The one who fashions a visionary ideal of community and demands it be realized by God, others, and himself. He enters the church with demands. He sets up his own law. He judges the brothers and God himself accordingly. He stands adamant, a living reproach to all in the circle of brethren. He acts as the creator of the community, as if his dream binds men together. When things don't go his way, he calls the effort a failure. And when his picture of ideals is destroyed, he sees the community going to smash. And then he becomes an accuser of his brethren who didn't achieve it, then an accuser of God, and finally, an accuser of himself. And the most profound thing I can say to you about Christian fellowship is that it's not something that we have to work to become, it's part of our identity. If you are a believer, you are already in the Christian fellowship. And I'm going to talk more about how we live out that reality, but you are a fellowship. In spite of all our foibles and mistakes that we make, 
you are a Christian community. You are a fellowship already because that is what Jesus has done. So moving on then, what does, why does fellowship matter? Well, there are a number of reasons why. One reason why is that it's a real blessing to us, particularly in the kind of society that we live in, at least, well, not just in the West, actually, all around the world. Because being a Christian gives us mutual support and encouragement to one another. And it gives us strength for the battlefield because the Christian life is a battle. Only our weapon uh, is love and the word of God, not guns and bombs. A member of this church, who I won't name, felt compelled to raise some issues with the school that their child attended because they were unhappy with some of the messaging that was being relayed to their, their, their young six-year-old child. And they were one of like two Christians in the meeting where this was discussed. And you know, they said to me, just that one other person made all the difference, kept me accountable. It gave me courage. And I know in Westminster Chapel, we're scattered all over London. Some of you even live on the other side of the M25. And it can be hard, can't it, when you're the only Christian in your workplace or in your university or in your school. Eric, good to see you. Long time no see. Eric's back from Canada. Great to see you. It can be hard. And Christian fellowship is so important in helping us uh, in this battle. It also equips us. The, the same person I mentioned told me that when they came to the chapel one day, they just had like a five minute conversation over a coffee with one of our hosting team. Um, He's a retired teacher, some of you will know who I'm talking about, and he was able to give you know, insights and wisdom into how to best raise things in an effective manner in a school. And it's an example in our diverse community that there are people here who've been through the things that you have been through, who have life experience and wisdom that you don't have, who can help you with the challenges in your life. And that's just one conversation in the church. And, you know, looking at it another way, it might be that you have some gifts that you can share to encourage others. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that if you've suffered, one reason why is so that you can help other people in the body who are suffering as well. But ultimately, the reason why fellowship, well, another reason, of course, is it's compelling to visitors who see the difference that Christ makes in such an individualistic, um, divided culture. But ultimately, the main reason why it's important is because it's part of our identity, we are a fellowship. He didn't choose to save us simply as individuals who then go off and find their way. He put us into a body. And if it's important to him, then friends, it has to be important to us if we're going to follow him and own his name. Now in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, the church understood something of their new identity as they worshipped together, they prayed together, they ate together, they shared possessions. And you know, the two things that strike me is you know, some of these would have been among those 3,000 who'd come from all over the world, and yet they then, and they would have had different priorities, even though they were all Jewish, yet they formed this new community. Very quickly, they're engaged in this common life here. But the thing most striking to me is, is verse 42 that flows into all the verses here, that they devoted themselves to doing various things, including being devoted to the fellowship. It tells me that while this is our identity, if we're gonna flourish in that identity, it requires individual decision and action. They devoted themselves, they continued steadfastly, they pressed on, they persevered because it was that important. And as we move to the next slide, and I wanna just talk about some of the examples of how we can do this, how we can live out our identity. The first is to commit to one another become a member of the church, get baptized as a believer if you haven't already done so. Because the way we express our commitment to one another in this church is by joining the church, by becoming a member. Not that that validates your Christianity or the reality of your relationship with Jesus, but it shows your commitment to not just having fellowship with him, but with having fellowship to one another. And if you've been attending for some time and you're, you're not a member, I'd really encourage you to come along on our next membership course. There's details at the back on some of those things with the QR codes. And also join a live group as well. Even if you are a member or you're not yet and thinking about it, that's the way we express our common life. We come together, we talk about the Bible, we pray for one another and grapple with how we live out the Christian life in 21st century London. So first of all, commit to one another. Next, be gracious to one another. 
Now, the chapel is a church of all shapes, sizes, colours and creeds. There are some people in this room who support Manchester United. There are some people who support Chelsea. There are some people who don't care about sport and they're gutted that the Euros have started because all the things they normally watch have been changed. <laughs> there are some people here who are shy introverts. There are others who just love invading personal space because they're extroverts who want to hug you and it comes from a good place, but yeah, that's right, sister, amen. And uh, she's gonna hug you after, so make an orderly cue after the message is done. She squeezes hard as well. Some people here are well-groomed, some aren't. And you know, some people here, they're gonna vote Labour, some are gonna vote Conservative, and some of them you're gonna disagree with profoundly about matters that are important to you. But they love Jesus. They're connected to him, they're connected to you, and within a church fellowship, we're not all gonna agree with one another. And frankly, a church where everyone has a kind of, like what I call the songs of praise smile. If you ever watch that show, people singing, the camera pans on, the smile comes out as they sing. That kind of church where everyone is just kind of surface level friends, but never getting deeper, there's never any disagreement. I would question whether that is the true connection fellowship. Because certainly in the New Testament and in the book of Acts, there was friction all the time. And that's why a lot of the epistles were written. Well, the solution to that, friends, is to acknowledge it and be gracious to one another. You know, Paul in Philippians talks about two sisters, Euodia and Syntyche, who were falling out. And he pleaded that they would be of one mind, that they would choose to seek fellowship with one another and let their identity in Christ take priority over other things. And one encouragement I'll give to you is that if this is your experience and you face that tension, it's a sign that the Lord is at work in this community and he's drawing diverse people to worship our one Lord Jesus. Richard Wormbrand was a Romanian Christian who uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War said publicly that communism, another form of community, was incompatible with Christianity. And as a result of that, he was imprisoned and he was tortured. And you can read his book, Tortured for Christ, if you want to hear more about his faithful witness in the years before he was released. Talking about the church in another one of his books, he says, never allow yourself to be discouraged by what you see in the church. I love the church, mostly for its ugliness. When you enter a hospital, you feel revulsion at the stench, the pus, the blood, the groanings. But this is the beauty of a hospital. It receives sick men and doctors and nurses are prepared to spend their days amid such unpleasantness in order to help. The beauty of the church is that it receives sinners and criminals. And after being by the church, received by the church, sometimes these sinners commit new sons, sins and the church, a loving mother, continues to keep them. I find this beautiful. And then of course, there is another side to the church. It contains not only wicked men and women, but a whole constellation of people who love God and one another wholeheartedly and put themselves at their service. Amen. This is the beautiful church that Jesus died for, friends. And how do we deal with this friction? Paul said later in his letter to the Ephesians, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Because friends, Jesus has forgiven you for far more than anyone in this room has harmed you. And I would argue, and I'd say to you, if you do have any unresolved tension with someone in here, take the opportunity to reconcile today or a very soon time. Next, we put this into practice by spending time with one another, by cultivating friendship, because this gathering is important. It's where we worship God in song. And I'm so grateful for Mike and the team, how faithful they are and how Christ-centered they are. We come here to come under the sound of the word of God, but it's not the only time we meet. We meet throughout the week. I've talked about life groups already. We meet for lunch after the service. There are calls on Zoom. There are uh, other gatherings that are going on with one another. And you know, these virtual meetings are good and the technology available allows us to keep in contact in a way that wasn't possible a few years ago. But virtual meetings can never replace physical ones. And sometimes they're needed like during COVID or because of the busynesses of life, but they must always be a supplement and never a replacement. The Christian psychologist, Kenneth Wilgus, who wrote the book, Biting the, um, Feeding the Mouth That Bites You, was recently asked what he considered the biggest danger to a teenager's mental health. And he said, in spite of the issues with drugs, pornography and abuse, 
He believed the greatest danger was the COVID-inspired loss of physical relationships in favour of digital meetings and other connections through social media. Because you lose something of the relational intimacy if everything you do is over a screen. And some of the, you know, you might, you might have seen that in meetings, right? At work or with friends. When the camera goes off, it means the person's checking other emails or they're, they're doing something else. They're not fully engaged. Well, if there was ever an incentive for parents to bring your children and teenagers to church, it's this, so they can see the importance of physical community. But in a spiritual level, that is true for every Christian as well. Spending time with each other is good for us as it helps us be shaped into the image of Christ, helps us love one another and grow. And the writer to the Hebrews said that for our own spiritual growth, spending time together is important because it can stop us from giving up on Jesus and uh, wavering from our confession. He said in chapter 10, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since the one who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting, not forgetting, not ignoring to gather together as some are in the habit of doing. Because it's not a 21st century problem, but encouraging each other all the more as the day of Christ's return is approaching. So spend time with each other. Next, be real with one another. James, the half-brother of Jesus in his epistle, encouraged the readers to confess their sins to one another and pray for one another. And I mean, that's given the context of um, praying for healing and how sometimes spiritual breakthrough can be held back by um, unrepented sin in our lives. But what we miss sometimes is that James is telling the church, telling someone in a church to share things that they've done wrong that they wouldn't want anyone else to know about in order to have healthy Christian fellowship. Because we don't want people to know some of the mistakes that we made. We're embarrassed if they knew who the real us was. And that can be spiritually weakening in one sense, because when sin is just between us and the sin we're committing, we can feel weak and powerless. But when we share it with another brother or sister, it can help us. And I'm not advocating, by the way, we share everything with everyone. Some things are sensitive. They need to be kept, um, you know, maybe with a close friend or just a, a handful of people. But what I am saying is, if all you're doing is putting your best polished, well-groomed self forward and never really talking truthfully and sharing what you're going through, don't be surprised if you have nothing better than a surface level friendship, friends, because that person is probably doing the exact same thing to you. But it gives us courage when we see people take the step, showing vulnerability, showing honesty to do the same. And that goes against the zeitgeist of our culture again. You know, we have a society that says any form of disagreement or difference is intolerance and it's the opposite of friendship. So we need to keep quiet and keep the status quo. But if you always bring your best self to church and don't be real, how does that serve other believers here? What good does that do for the person who is struggling, who wants to share, um, but is afraid to do so? It does no good. It takes courage and vulnerability to share and be real with one another because you're not the only person going through an ethical dilemma at work. You're not the only person who um, feels guilty about a mistake you made at an office party or the lack of time you spend with your children. And you're not the only person who have committed some more serious sins that you don't want to share. I don't want to encourage you that within our fellowship, make close friends where you can be real one another and show them who you are. As Paul said to the Thessalonians, we cared so much for you that we were pleased to share not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because we have come so dear to us. Share your life with one another. Next, I want to encourage you to use your gift. Those two verses on the slide talk about how the gifts we are given are not just given for ourselves. They are given to bless the wider body and help us come in together for all that Jesus has for us. They reply to the upfront spiritual gifts we see in services. And maybe now is the time for some of you to be praying that the Lord might give you a word to share. He might give you a tongue to bring or the gift of interpretation or faith to pray for healing for someone who's going through something. But they also include the behind the scenes gifts, gifts of administration, finance, encouragement. All of us have a gift and we're called to use it to serve God and to serve one another. Now, of course, we go through seasons of life, maybe illness, maybe young children, particularly busy times at work, which mean you, you, know, you can't serve as much, if at all. And that's fine. There's no judgment. But to the extent you can, or when you come out of that season, use your gifts to serve one another as we are connected to each other. 
Next, this is probably the most sensitive one. Correct one another with grace. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, if you're aware of a member of the church who is willfully sinning without seeking to repent or struggling with that sin, you should sensitively one-on-one -on -one, call them out on it. And if they do nothing as a result of that, you bring another couple of trusted friends and repeat the conversation. And failing that, you notify the church. And in our context, that would be telling the elders about it who would consider the best way to take that forward. And Jesus goes on to say, if these people still don't repent with a heavy heart, you need to put them out of the church. And Paul in his letter to the Corinthians explains further and says, the reason why that is, is that our connected fellowship is called to model something of Christ's holiness. And if we allow unchecked sin and hypocrisy to go on, then that sin will spread like yeast or leaven in a batch of dough. It will affect the whole community and it will hurt that person even more because they're not confronted with their sin and called to repent because sin brings death and decay. And um, that's why we need to love one another enough to talk into these situations. And of course, the yardstick for doing this comes from the word of God. And Christian fellowship, again, to go against the prevailing view in our culture, it's not about maintaining the status quo, no matter what. It's not about keeping the peace at any cost. And it isn't about certainly letting people continue in sin, discontentment, and a lack of flourishing. We need to speak into each other's lives, which is hard. When we receive it, we need to respond with grace and reflect on it and consider if it's valid. And if we think it is, we need to respond uh, in faith and, and repent of that sin if that's what's happening. And that's even harder. And it's hard for me just as it is for each of you. But if we're gonna be that koinonia connected functioning body, we need to overcome that fear. We need to speak to each other. We need to receive this. And if necessary, we act on it. The wounds of a friend are trustworthy, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive. Peter also says though, love covers a multitude of sins. And I have to kind of temper what I've just said. We don't wanna be a church where it's like, oh, they're sinning, I'm gonna come to them today. Oh, look at you, look at you, look at you. No, love covers a multitude of sins. That means we're gonna accept some people in spite of their foibles. We're gonna love them. We're not gonna be a condemnatory community looking for slip ups and relishing them. But what we are saying is that if this is a serious sin that is not being repented of, that is not being struggled with in the life, because we love that person, we've got to call them to do what Jesus called them to do, to repent of their sin and follow him. And that's hard, which is why Jesus says at the end of that excerpt of Matthew 18, that if we're doing that, the Holy Spirit is with us to validate those decisions. Because where two or three are gathered in his name, I am there among them, Jesus said. And he said that in the context of church discipline. So correct one another with grace and love. And next, and indeed finally, we need to make sacrifices for one another. I've avoided looking at some illustrations of koinonia around finances and hospitality because they're already expressed in this passage and Keegan, um, Andy and Guy will be talking about some of them in weeks ahead. But a common thread among them is that idea of sacrifice making a personal decision that might leave you worse off, but you take it in order to make the wider body or a specific brother or sister better. It's for the good of the wider fellowship. And you know, friends, I've been at the church, I was talking to a visitor today, and I don't look old enough, but I've been at the chapel now for over 18 years. And you know, the chapel is an unusual beast. Those of you who know the history, you know, some people have said it's like Charing Cross Station, everyone's going back and forth and you can never make friends. One person described it as the white elephants of the white elephant of the congregational church that people want to get rid of because it was an embarrassment. But I love this church, and I know many of you do as well. It's a central London church that I think has a family feel that isn't common in other well-known central London churches that are often appealing to just one demographic. It has members all over London and beyond. We have a regular turnover as newcomers move to London and others move out or they move to other churches or the suburbs. We have a diverse population again that I think is relatively uncommon in some churches. We've got different economic, ethnic, generational and theological backgrounds here that enrich our corporate life. I mean, there isn't a typical chapel person. And I know a lot of guests sometimes are, are shocked by what they see because when all they've read about is the history of the chapel, they, they kind of think we're going to be a little bit different sometimes. And it requires a lot of work to keep the church going. And 
You know, the leaders of the church know that and it, and it is hard, so please do pray for them. And I say all that again to reiterate, I love the church and I know that you do too. And I can say from that standpoint, it is hard being a member of Westminster Chapel. In many ways, it would be a lot easier if you went to that church down the road from you that your Christian friend who lives in your neighborhood goes to. Because by the time your ser their service is finished um, and we get home, they've already got home, had a meal, watched the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's a full day to come here. And it's hard, right? Because we have busy jobs and we're, we're tired in the week. I've been a member here as a 20 something um, fresh person fresh out of uni. I've been a 30 something married man. I've been a 40 something, I'm still an early 40 something uh, father. <laughs> And each one of those seasons of life has brought joy, but it's also brought challenges. And it, you know, it, it can be hard being a member here. And those of you who've been a member for some time, even if you don't really talk about it, you can relate to it. You know that it is hard being a member of this church. And if God is calling you to leave, there's nothing wrong in that at all. Because the same God who joins us together through Jesus is the same in other faithful churches. So don't feel condemned if the Lord is calling you elsewhere. But for those who are called to stay here, who love the church, God calls us to make sacrifices for one another because there's no way the church can remain functioning if we don't do that. We have to sacrifice the time and comfort that we might have had if this was in a local church. We sacrifice our comfort zone because as I said, the mixture of people here means that we see that friction sometimes. We come into contact with people where it's not easy to commune with one another but we persevere and we make that sacrifice, even if we have to make the first move in showing vulnerability. We have to sacrifice our spare time. Again, those of you who commute know that your evenings, you just want to get home and go to sleep or see your family. But we've got to prioritize, not prioritize above our families, but we do need to make it a priority to commune with one another outside of meetings where we can. Life groups is our organized way of doing it. But I know some of you go for lunch in the week or chat in the week or particularly the the younger folks do things in the evenings together. But that is a sacrifice. And think of ways you could do that. Um, some people here are students. They're a long way from their biological family. Sacrifice some of your personal family time by inviting them. Be a surrogate family to those whose families aren't with them here. Include single or divorced friends in the activities with your nuclear family so that they can participate as well and enjoy some of the benefits of that. Befriend newlyweds as well, share wisdom with them. If you're single or have no children or caring commitments, consider if there are friends in the church where you could offer to babysit young children so the husband and wife or the single mum or single dad can have some social time away from the family. And make an effort to look after elderly members of the church who may not have family who live nearby and need extra care and help. Sacrifice by serving in a ministry and sacrifice by praying, because praying in some ways is one of the biggest sacrifices because you have to commit to doing it, fight the distraction and pray when we've got so many things to pray for in our own world. We need to make sacrifices for one another. Jesus showed his love for us by giving his life for us. He said, greater love is no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Well, as Jesus does this, he invites us to live our best life together by laying down our lives, hopes and dreams to follow him and serve one another as we share in his fellowship together. And I'm gonna close by the reading that Paul actually read earlier in the service, though you know, neither of us knew that was gonna happen as a picture of what this sacrificial servant heartedness looks like. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming dead, uh, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Friends, Jesus gave his best life so that we might have everlasting life. And he calls us to live our best life together in our koinonia fellowship. Please join me in doing that in our church and seeing all God has for us. Amen. <laughs>I should have given the band warning, I'll pray. <laughs> Father God, we thank you so much for your glorious son who gave himself for us so that we would no longer be uh, under your wrath, enemies against you, 
but adopted as your children, forgiven of our sin, reconciled to you, brought into your family, connected to your son and connected to one another. And I just pray, Lord, that all that I've said today, um, you might, by your Holy Spirit, underline certain things for each one of us, Lord, and help us consider what we can do to live out the reality that we are your fellowship. Amen.